Fast, efficient, and affordable business grade hosting solutions, domain registration, SSL certificates, and more. We also monitor and provide website security and update services, website builds, email hosting, amongst other sensational products. If you have a question about your web page or your presence on the internet in general, no job is too big or too small. Visit our website today, or better yet, contact us at blueoceanwebhosting.com.au and leave your website issues to us. Big ones, little ones, fiddly ones, powerful ones. The ones for the car or the truck, caravan, boat, mobility scooter, solar system. In fact, for any kind of battery, go straight to Battery Central Ipswich. They'll even help you when you know what you need to power but have no idea what'll do the job. Battery Central Ipswich, 280 Brisbane Street, West Ipswich, in the Yellow Building. Expert advice, better batteries, best prices every day. That's Battery Central Ipswich. Welcome to episode 764 of the Aussie Tech Heads. I'm Jason Oakley and this is Will Tompkinson. Hey, Will. Good evening, sir. How's things going for you? Yes, yes, they are. Lismore's treading water again. Oh, I tell you what, they can't catch a break. It's exactly four weeks. There was a 20, I think it was the 28th that happened the first time. It was the 28th that happened the second oh, time. Cow. It wasn't as high, thankfully. It was only, um, it was only, well, they call it 10 point or something which only when i just just went over the levy but here's the problem with the levy well there's several problems but the main problem is that it keeps water out at six foot high on the other side of the levy right yep. which is fine until the water breaches the levy and then as it comes over the levy instead of the water just coming up um like in a flood the water because it's covering such a large area it just comes up pretty quick but when it breaches the levee, it breaches in two or three places that are just slightly lower. So you get this surge of water come over and then it sort of backs up because the, it's dropped again on the outside of the levee. So you get these surges coming through, oh. that are, you know, six inches high. Yep. And those surges, when they break, when they hit windows and hit brick walls and hit things like that, they tend to shatter them. Oh. So it's just having water coming up evenly and having equal pressure everywhere at the same time. Yep. You're getting these surges of, of waters coming in that's it's literally yeah you're getting it's it's breaking stuff and causing damage so even though the it was only i say only like the C, the middle of cbd once it once it breached i think it was four or five foot and yep. ended up being in the middle and deeper in other places but the thing was it caused more damage because of the surges yeah uh. So it, this time people, and the only saving grace is a lot of the shops and a lot, of, there were still people in evac centers, a lot of homes hadn't, homes hadn't even been touched yet. Yep. So there was a lot of shops and a lot of houses that were still empty or hadn't even been cleaned out. Um, the problem with that is it means there's a lot of debris still floating around. Yep. So you've got that surging as well. So you've got, you know, broken lounges and tables and kegs and gas bottles yep. surging down the main street and just running into things and shattering stuff. So even though a lot of places really didn't get any more damaged per se from flood, a lot of them got actually broken damage from the surging water. So a lot of windows got pushed out, a lot of brick walls got pushed over, a lot of fences got pushed over, a lot of trees got pushed over, ah. a lot of light poles got pushed over. So there was actually a lot more damage even though there was less water. Is it time to move out of Lismore and just write it off the map? Oh, look. Lismore should never have been put where it was put. And that actually goes for the vast majority of major towns. Should never actually be where they are. The reason they are where they are is because they're on the river. Yep. And in the early days of settling, the That's river great. was the lifeblood. Yep. But the town should never have been expanded upon other than the necessary things required. Every 
thing that happened should have happened. You know, in, in most towns, you've only got to travel five minutes in any direction and you've come across higher ground. Yep. It generally doesn't take that long to get higher ground. Um, so this is true of most towns. If they're on a river, they should only have, you know, like the dock and they should have maybe um, some warehousing and stuff on the river and everything else should be built away. But everybody because, loves a riverfront. That's where you can multiply the cost of the value by 10 times. Well, a riverfront property is often different than a CBD river property. Like, so a riverfront property often, um, you only overlook the river. Yep. And quite often there's a, you know, there's a cliff or there's a, a huge rise that, you know, doesn't generally flood, but the the town itself is built as low as possible to the river. So when they built the wharfs and the jetties and everything, because yeah. you got to remember they only had like horse drawn buggies. So if you've got a jetty and you're unloading it with a horse drawn carriage, you want that as flat as possible coming in and out of town. Yep. You don't want the horse to have to lug stuff up and down hills, especially like um, often you'll find that the jetty is actually slightly higher than the town so that when the horse was fully the buggy was fully loaded they'd actually get a downhill slant coming into town uh, if you've ever been to geelong it's a classic example of that where the jetties are four or five hundred meters long right um just to get enough of the old track the old you know traffic that used to come in and it actually goes level and then actually dips down into the main street the, the main street of geelong is lower than sea level <laughs> or I think it's at sea level, but you go down from the jetty. Yeah. Um, and that's the problem. Like, the, It's okay to have your transport hub there, but you don't want the town there. No. In a place like Lismore, it's not even a rare occasion of floods. It floods annually. Like it, to get two or three floods a year isn't uncommon, yeah. but to get two or three floods as big as they've been is quite uncommon. You'll often get, a couple of foot of water, you know, even a foot of water, six inches of water down the main street. Like small floods happen quite regularly, and it's sort of people don't even sort of notice them because it happens so often. <laughs> it's like, oh, my feet are wet. Oh. <laughs> you know, like, um, but yeah, it, it really should never have been built there. And they were warned, you know, they were warned when they built the town that there was floods that would, that would level the town, but they didn't listen. Oh. And I'm not the only one. I mean, you know, um, everyone's head. Um, what a uh, you know, the, the thing like Evans head, right? It's a beachside town. You don't think of beachside towns being subject to flooding, no, <laughs> but they flood for an entirely different reason. Usually, with a beachside town, you've got dunes, natural dunes that build up on the beach. So when you get water coming in from the flats coming into the beach, yep. the water can't go anywhere because the river's 10 times wider than it should be. And the only part of the town that's lower than, than the, you know, the beach is the river. Yeah. So if the river is already flooded, the water literally can't go anywhere. It has to go out. Yeah. So the, the funny thing is that it floods for the exact opposite reason. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a natural levee bank created by the, by the sand dunes being created, you know? Yeah. So, you know, but. I mean, what do you do? Like a lot of people said, oh, look, we're not worried. We're just going to rebuild and re redo. And it's like, yeah, but. Not in the same place. Should you? <laughs> I mean, yes, you can. And yes, you're able to. But should you? <laughs> you know, really, you've got Lismore Heights. You've got Canela Bar. You've got um, all these surrounding districts that you've literally traveled five minutes in any direction and you're on a hill. Yeah. Like Lismore is literally in a valley. Like it, it is, it is literally a bowl. It, it, it's surrounded by hills in every in every direction. You know, like why would you build back in Lismore again for the sake of picking? I mean, you've, for the most part, you're not starting with anything anyway. You've you've lost everything, so you're either getting an insurance payout if you're lucky enough to get insurance, or you've got obviously got the cash if you're going to rebuild. You've got the cash flow available to do that anyway. Isn't your so insurance going to be incredibly high soon? They won't bear the brunt of it happening so often. Um, see, okay, so when they built the levee banks, they said that the CBD will never flood again. Um, so the CBD, all the businesses could get flood insurance. But what that meant was as soon as they built the levee bank, all the low-lying areas that don't normally flood because the CBD floods first 
and would divert enough water away from residential areas. Yep. Now, the residential areas are flooding, but the residential areas can't get insurance. So now you've got a CBD that can get insurance that still floods anyway, and you've got residential areas that weren't flooding that are now that can't get insurance. <laughs> I don't think I'd want to build a new home on a place that I couldn't get any insurance at all. Well, when you build a new home, you have to. It's part of the deal. You you have to, for the well, not if you buy it outright, but if you're paying a home loan, yep. For the period for the time of the home loan, you have to have full insurance. Otherwise, that's like what I got here. Yeah. Yeah. So how are they going to build there if they can't get insurance? <laughs> but they definitely want to build in the flooded area. They can't well, get a loan. The way I. Uh, the understanding that I've been told about the last couple of months, and I was completely unaware of it until the last big flood a month ago, um, people who are living in the housing estates, apparently the owner of the house, or the developer of the housing estates is insuring the properties, not an insurance agent. Oh, okay. So... He's got deep pockets. Well, this is the thing, isn't it? Like... But technically, as a business, a commercial, a commercial um, entity, he can get insurance because most of the commercial properties in Lismore can get insurance, even if the residentials can't. Right. So I'm assuming that he collects everybody's claim and then he puts in a claim. I, I don't know, but that's what they're saying. Like Because they're getting new houses and insurance companies won't touch it, they're saying that it's all private insurance now. I don't think I would like to live there anyway, <laughs> <I'm not laughs> regardless of that, if the developer insures me or the insurance company does. Yeah, because developers have never gone broke. No. <laughs> Just look at the um, towers in Sydney that are all cracking and yeah. the developers have changed names or gone broke or just shut down. Yeah, I don't... I don't... It's... it's For me, like now it's a perfect opportunity to be gone get out of there you yeah. know but they won't right? they're stubborn <laughs> <laughs> basically the people who are there have been through that much they're, they're, it's kind of when i moved to you this royal swamp <laughs> they said i'd be tough to build a castle here but i build it anyway and it's second to the swamp so i build a second one that one second to the swamp I built a third one that burned down, fell over, then sank into the swamp, but the fourth one stayed up. And that's what you're going to get, yeah. kid. That, that's pretty much exactly castle what it is. in all these swamps. Yeah, that, that's basically what it's uh, it's like. It's like, this is our legacy. We've built this legacy. We're not going to defer from this because My a bit of water. My granddaddy moved to Lismore <laughs> and we're never going to leave. So I, I don't. I mean, honestly, Lismore's not my first choice to live anymore no, no. Uh, fighting aside the town's dead yep, like yep. people are going to go cook at me for saying that but it's not a flourishing town like the the entertainment and attractions that were there aren't there anymore like the bowl the Lisbon Grand Prix shut down a few years ago um the bowling alleys not reopening the roller skating rink may or may not reopen um the speedway and showground and everything's, you know, it's going to be a while before they get running again. The go-kart track's probably damaged, you know. So there's really nothing there entertainment-wise. Like none of the clubs and pubs, they, they all went under. Yeah. When I was you know, working they, there, I stayed out on the coast at the beach rather than yeah. in Lismore. Just you know, there, there's just nothing there now. Like, there's no reason. There, there's literally no reason to stay there. Like if everybody has their business and their house already, if everybody moved... 23 foot to the left yep that solved this problem you know like you haven't got to go far i'm not saying pack up and go to sydney i'm just saying go three minutes that way yeah in any direction pick a direction <laughs> and just go three minutes that way like <laughs> to the hills yeah exactly like, it's not not far and there's you know okay you know uh, i'm gonna buy a and and you that. can get insurance up the hill well yeah and the thing is the other side of Warella, once you go out while I own through the flats past the tip and you go back up the hill on the other side, there's nothing out there. Yep. There's just farmland out there. I'm sure a farmer wouldn't mind a few million bucks to subdivide his land a bit. Yeah. You know, some, Not but anyway, so, so, yeah. farm has these days anyway. Oh well, yeah. <laughs> I mean, we had, um, minor flooding here again as well. Your place still haven't been fixed up yet. I, no, 
So I finally got a call from the insurance company. Well, the, the insurance company's been good. They've contacted me on several occasions. It's not the insurance company I have an issue with. They're using a the sub subbing out to a company called Australian Disaster uh, Inspectors or something in or something or other is the company they're using that supposedly is the ones who come and does all the claims. And um, I hadn't heard from them for ages. And actually, there's another company I'm supposed to be hearing. I'm supposed to have heard from by now as well. And it's the mob who's going to come and do the asbestos. But um, yeah, so they they rang me on Monday and said, "Oh, you know, when can we come out? Or have you, what day were you planning on being in the area?" They're like, "Oh, tomorrow." You know, lunchtime. I'm like, "Well, no, not lunchtime. I run a business, but you're quite welcome to come before eight or after five. It's your choice." He goes, oh, okay, I'll be there at seven. Sweet, no worries. And 15 minutes later, another colleague from the same company who obviously doesn't know how to read a computer screen <laughs> rang me and goes, oh, I just want to book a time. I'm like, I literally just told such and such that you were going to be there. He was going to, I'm going to meet him there at seven. He's like, oh, yeah, it does say that here. <laughs> like, okay, so I'm not overly confident. Off to ability. a good start. <laughs> Right from the get go, you're not you're not really inspiring me with any confidence here. Ugh. Anyway, seven o'clock rocks around, nothing, not a phone call, not a peep, and that was what four, three days, three going on four days ago. Yep. And um, yeah, nothing, no, no communique, no phone call, no email, no nothing. Slack. So, needless to say, these people are going to be fun to deal with. Yeah. <clears throat> so I'll be basically saying this is what you will be doing. You had the opportunity, you screwed it up. So, you know, I'm not overly interested in playing games anymore. Can't wait forever. Yeah, well, that's it. You know, I've got stuff to do. I've got things to fix. <laughs> <laughs> you know, buildings to repair and a business to run. Well, right. and well, on top of that, I've got a business to run. Yeah. Yep. You know, like it's not like it's a minor claim. Like it's a major claim. Like it's everything in the granny flat, the furniture, the 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 insulation, the VJ board, the ceiling, the carpet, like it's everything. The kitchen benches, they're all mouldy and water damaged. There's all that chipboard, that high quality yep. chipboard that they use. <laughs> um, probably the only part in the granny flat that's not actually affected is the bathroom because it's a wet area, so it's designed it's to be wet. To. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, it's probably okay, but even in my shed, like I've got a heap of mould on a lot of my tools, my welder, my um, a lot of my power tools now are getting mould growing on them. Yep. Um, you know, my benches have all got mold growing up the side of them, and I haven't even been there to get stuff out, I just haven't had a chance because I've been working. But, like, if they had have sent somebody around a month ago, yep. would have been <laughs> um, fine, they would have had all this stuff sorted by now, and it would have been cleaned up and would have been dealt with. But it's just getting worse. <sighs> um, and then I've got on the other hand, I've got the the, the what we call the carport, it's actually a bit of a it's not one of the it's actually the original shed that was built on the property. So they could build the house. They lived in the shed to build the house. So it's yep. asbestos line, lead paint, all the good things. <laughs> and um, that's all. Well, they're not only now, they're not only asbestos sheets, which by itself is bad enough to deal with, but they're all moldy asbestos sheets. Yeah. So the upside is the mold should hold the asbestos in place. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> so it should be easy Make to remove. Make it safer for removal, yeah. <laughs> good work. Yeah, because black mold's fine, right? Yeah. Yeah. I, mean, I had that in my ensuite when I moved into this place. Black mold, asbestos. And... <laughs> black mold everywhere, but I've got some <clears throat> King King brand exit mold or something and squirted oil over it lots and seems to be clearing up nice. Vinegar. But the problem is if you've got mold you can see, there's, there's mold, mold you, you can't, can't see. Yeah, it, It's the stuff you can't see is the problem because if you can see it, you're only seeing a fraction of what there actually is. Yeah. Um, and anything that's not metal, effectively, absorbs mold. So even if you kill it on the surface, yep. it'll yep. come back because it, it it's literally ingrained into the material. Yeah, it has been. Um, plastics and rubbers and leathers are actually worse than timber, but timbers, unless it's hardwood, um, so any softwood timber, it's just it just goes inside it. You know, like you, the only way to do it is to rip it all out and replace it. But, you know. Yeah, I'll get it all <laughs> renovated one day. Well, if it's water damage, you can prove it's water damage. Even if you had a, a busted pipe or a leaky tap and it's all caused by water damage, you can claim it on insurance. Oh, all right. That's what your insurance is for. Yep. Um, but, yeah, it's 
it's um got all that and then we just had a massive like we actually copped a heap of rain the other day at work even we had a heap here but had a lot more at work right and um <clears throat> not flooding your roads there again <clears throat> well some oh, we were worried that some of the crossings are going to go under because we like the rivers haven't gone down they're still high yep um it doesn't really and the, the rain's got nowhere to go it just runs off it doesn't soak anywhere so it really doesn't take much to start flooding and shutting roads again now. Yep. So, yeah, that's been fun. Ah, fun and games, huh? Because I've got nothing better to be doing. No. <laughs> <laughs> We've been having <coughs> slow rain for the last week or so. It's going to continue for a while. The river's up near the top of the banks again, so... Yeah, you had a heat the other day, didn't you? In yep. Like in one one foul swoop yeah <laughs> it'll keep happening for a while yet but they reckon it'll go away eventually but <clears> as long as it as long as it can keep raining as much as it wants as long as it's not enough you know as long as it doesn't bottleneck the river system that's when you run into problems yep yep we got so we got hills and all the water runs down into the river from the hills and that's where we get it not so mm. much if it rains here a lot it rains up there, and that's what floods catchments. us down here. Yep. Yeah. And see, that's the other problem, too. Like, you've got, um, like, here as well, they're also doing dam releases at the moment. Oh, okay. So it really doesn't take much rain on top of a dam release, and you've got a flood. Yep. And they've got too much in the dam. Yeah, well, they're, you know, well over 100%. They try to bring it, they try to keep them at 100% because... They call 100% full for drinking water. Yep. See, and then they call anything from 100 to 200% flood mitigation. Right. So this is something they changed a few years ago. So in the 2013 floods, the dams were at like 65%. And then like, it used to be like 85 or 90% for Wyvernhoe used to start the breach and then 100% the dam would breach. So they tried to keep it below 90 because, you know, so when they were, when they were giving the dam levels and they're telling everybody that we're running out of water and they're saying we're at 40%, that same 40% then is actually 80% now. Right. <laughs> so when we're on level three restrictions because we're in a 40%, yep. but we're not on any water restrictions at all, 80% because it's all that... Well. Yeah, now 100% is what would have been 50% yep. and 200% is what would have been 100%. So at 160% or 180%, they start the, 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 they start the releases to yep. minimize the chances of the breaching. But because they've, <laughs> it's still exactly the same amount of water. <laughs> they've just changed what they call it. Yep. And yet for some reason, 80% we have use as much water as you want. Even though it was exactly the same as the old 40%, which was quick, we're going to die and run out of water. Don't use it. <laughs> huh? Uh, <laughs> That's the same amount of megalitres. It hasn't changed. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's crazy. Uh, but that's the problem they changed that they didn't tell anybody so now when they're going oh the dams are at 120 percent people are like no they're gonna explode and it's like yep. no <laughs> it's just an old way of saying that it's like 60. it's 20 percent into the mitigation that would have been 60 percent before <laughs> but, <sighs> sorry <laughs> we'd like to thank everyone for their support of the show um yeah and um everybody um obviously there's as many people watched when they must have i'm assuming everybody who listens to the podcast normally listen to it and then must have gone back and watched um YouTube. at least the end of the the show because we had the the tribute on there because we've got almost as many views on the youtube video as we do on the podcast which doesn't <laughs> happen no, no. <laughs> so but no we'd like to thank everybody and um kim i spoke i actually went to the funeral um and had a chat to Kim and, and some of the family and that, and they're very grateful. They, they've they read most of the stuff that's gone up on the Facebook page and the YouTube page and stuff like that. And and uh, she, does, um, she does send her thanks for all that. And uh, apparently there was quite a lot of people watching the stream live. So I don't know how many of those was. you guys and how many of that was, uh, you know, other people. But there was a lot of people apparently. So, um, so yeah. 
And I like way. The Land of Make Believe by Bucks Fizz. That's always yeah. been one of my favorites. That's a cool song. We might actually chuck that on the end of this, eh? All yeah. Right. At the end of this episode, we'll throw that on there for the people who didn't. Well, uh, we won't be able to monetize it. <laughs> yeah, because that's the problem we have. <laughs> um, yeah, for the people who weren't the, at, who weren't watching the funeral, or whatever. Yeah, the Land of Make Believe was one of one of his favorite songs. Yeah. Um, obviously, anything Elvis was his other favorite songs, <laughs> but <laughs> but um, up there Gazali. But uh, yeah, I don't think Elvis did up there because. <laughs> So we'll, we might throw that on the end because that's a, it is. I have to admit, it's a rather eclectic song, and it doesn't. It wouldn't have a very big following. Uh, not that many people, I'm sure, would know about it. Honestly, probably not. Yeah. <laughs> so it might be something worth throwing. It's a Eurovision it. song. And it, yeah. Way back so, in the day. Um. So yeah, if you want to, if you want to check that out, just hang around to the end of the show. We'll put that on after after the wrap up. So. Remind me that when I'm doing the producing. I, I'll, you'll, you'll hear this part of the show and you listen back to the yeah. show again. So. <laughs> That's how it works. Uh, I suppose um, we should start on some news then. So I'll quickly say before we do that, just for a reminder for those who may have forgotten, um, if you've got any patrons or PayPals or coffee or anything like that, can you please just postpone it for a little longer? Yeah. Um, just so we know, we've got to sort some details out behind the scenes. Um, so if you could just pause those payments... Probably it'll probably be another two or three, maybe four weeks, and then we'll be able to get back on top of it and know what's going on. Yep. So that'll that'll help us out greatly. His wife's very supportive of us continuing running stuff and oh, Kim, yeah, give us Kim's access great. to things. Kim's great. So this is going to be a, a fun conversation in a couple of weeks. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Leave it till then when things calm down a bit. Yeah, exactly. In mid-2021, Apple provided customer data to hackers after they masquerade themselves as law enforcement officials, shows a new report. According to people familiar with the matter, the company provided basic subscriber details due to forged emergency data requests. The publication explains that normally such requests are only provided with a search warrant or subpoena signed by a judge. However, such emergency requests don't require a court order. Alongside Apple, Meta, Facebook's parent company, also gave hackers users data. Snapchat also received a forged legal request from the same hackers, although it's unclear whether that company provided info. An Apple representative referred to a section of its law enforcement guidelines instead of a formal comment on the matter. The guidelines referenced by Apple say that a supervisor for the government or law enforcement agent who submitted the request may be contacted and asked to confirm to Apple that the emergency request was legitimate. According to the publication, hackers affiliated with cyber crime group known as Recursion Team are believed to be behind some of the forged legal requests. Some of the hackers could be miners located in the UK and US, according to researchers. In addition, one of them could be the mastermind behind the cyber crime group that hacked Microsoft, Samsung and Nvidia. Alison Nixon, Chief Research Officer at cyber firm at Unit 221B. That is a great name for a cyber firm, 221B. <laughs> Comes in defense of Apple and Facebook's teams that handle law enforcement. In every instance where these companies messed up, at the core of it, there was a person trying to do the right thing. I can't tell you how many times <laughs> trust and safety teams have quietly saved lives because employees had the legal flexibility to rapidly respond to a tragic situation unfolding for a user. But it wasn't, was it? And yet when the FBI go, hey, can you give us this guy's details so we can unlock his phone and ping him for an arrest nah. that we've already done and have backdoored in anyway, but we need you to approve it so that we can use it in court. Yep. Go, no. No. <laughs> <laughs> but it wasn't legitimate, was it? It was bollocks. And they went ahead and... Oh, they well, I mean, like, you got to admit, if you get something from... <sighs> are you really going to... I mean... You got to think how many legal subpoena requests they'd get, right? Are you really going to ring up every single time one comes in and confirm it? I mean, no, you should have some way of knowing. You think? I think it's the, a little well, too much. It's automation. not up to you to make sure they're legit. It's up to the police to make sure their documents don't get leaked. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, they got access to it somehow. Maybe Lapsus got into the police network. I wouldn't put it past them. Oh well, of course they. I mean, they they. In everywhere, <laughs> they're gonna be in there. There's they're a lovely story about them coming up soon. What lapses? Yeah, 
Yeah. I thought you were going to say the police department. Like, There's no lovely <laughs> stories about the police department. No, no, that's why I was really confused. <laughs> <with that. laughs> oh, um, so, <clears throat> excuse me. There was a story I saw no, about the Australian not... police department who's going to get even more ability to take over people's social network accounts oh, and the, yeah, Amer- just and the American gov- American police are like, geez, I wish we had as much access as Australia gets. They're awesome. We're jealous. Yeah. So I like it... delete that one. Let's do a story about lapses instead. Yeah, I, I saw it too. I went, nah, I can't really bother, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> it's too depressing. <clears throat> so speaking of depressing. Yep. Uh, it's fair to say that many of us will have some type of inadvertently bricked device by applying the wrong firmware by mistake. Yeah, I've done it. I've bricked numerous computers and devices and... over the years. <laughs> if you're lucky, then there's usually some low-level refreshing tools that can save the day and return them, the item in question, back to health, which uh, not so much in the old biased. It's a, it's a pull-and-replace job generally. But yeah. Um. So, but we're guessing that among you be plenty of people who've had to discard a PCB or replace an inaccessible microcontroller chip as well. Spare a thought then for the consumer appliance manufacturer Electrolux, who's an AEG, whose AEG subsidiary has bricked combi microwave ovens across the swath of Western European Dutch, uh, Western European, Western European Dutch, excuse me. <laughs> I think that's supposed to be in brackets. Uh, They managed uh, this impossible feat by distributing an over-the-air update. Okay, so this, um, before we go further, basically, this uh, microwave, um, it's an IoT. It's an Internet of Things, so it's a smart microwave connected to the Internet, right? Just so you've got... It was smart. Well, yeah. (laughs) They managed this impossible feat by distributing an over-the-air update that contained the firmware for a steam oven instead. Worse still, the update had disabled over-the-air updates, meaning that the fix required physical access to the oven. We can't help sympathising with whichever poor AEG engineer had the ultimate bad day work, but at the same time, we should perhaps consider the difference between a computer and an appliance, and where there should be a need for an oven or a phone in, for an oven to phone home in the first place. Sure, such devices have been computer controlled for decades, but should microcontroller be doing the task needed if it needs constant updates? We're guessing this oven is some kind of cloud aspect to which um, AEG um, collects customers' data and the user to control it via their app. But even so, it should have served as a warning to anybody tempted by an internet connected kitchen appliance. If the internet isn't necessary for the food to be cooked, don't, don't connect it. Uh, we feel sorry for anybody who might have put the pizza in the oven just before it was bricked and watching disappointment as a tasty meal remained uncooked. <laughs> so here's the downfall of the IoT that I talked about a couple of years ago. It was bad enough when we had smart fridges. They were, they were one thing because the only thing, they weren't connecting to the internet to run the fridge. Mm. They were connecting to the internet to tell you you needed more milk. Right. And they don't work anymore because <laughs> standards have changed since then yeah. and they don't get updated or don't have enough memory or speed to update. So you've just got a nice wallpaper background on your fridge front. Mm. But now, well, a friend of mine uh, has a, um internet um, kettle. Well, it's actually not a kettle, it's a uh, coffee maker, yep. coffee yep. percolator. You know, the ones that you put the jug underneath and you turn it on and it drips the coffee into the jug and an hour later you get half a cup of coffee. <laughs> yeah, one of those. So it's set up so that when is at work or um, coming home from wherever they're out, they can turn it on so that when they get home, yep. they've got coffee. Now, this makes a couple of assumptions. One, you've put the jug on the hot plate to put the coffee in. It also assumes you've put water in it and that you've put coffee in the filter in where it needs to go. Had you have done none of those things, it doesn't make coffee. Yeah. It doesn't tell you that you haven't done any of those things. And it, it continues to function as if you have done those steps. 
but when you come through the front door, you have a river of coffee going from the kitchen to the lounge room. Oh, yikes. <laughs> <laughs> The one um, thing we the, like about <clears throat> our internet connected things is we can turn on the air conditioners in the house half an hour before we're heading home so it'll cool yeah. stuff down or warm it up. I do the same thing and, and that I don't mind because once again it doesn't need to it doesn't need the internet to run and to update and to perform its job. It just uses the internet as a switch. Yeah. Which is fine. But I just hope when, it doesn't think that it's a steam oven or something next yeah, week. <laughs> when you have device, why a microwave even needs a firmware update? I, I, I don't understand. But why? I mean, what, what are you going to do? You, you're going to overclock your oven? Yeah. Well, what what possible reason do you have to to need it to think it's something other than what it already is? Most of us just go one, two, three minutes <laughs> on full power and then come back. I don't press the pizza, I don't press the popcorn, I don't press this or that. <laughs> it's all just like 100% for two minutes, done. Yeah. And the the problem is that this, I mean, if an engineer can accidentally put the wrong code in and brick all those devices, then obviously, you know, I'm, a sh- I'm, I'm sure they're, they're, the built-in security is, is hugely safe. Like, I'm sure there's no possible way that an external source could do exactly the same thing. Yep. Especially when they auto-run the update that they're fed. So oh, there's no right. possible way that somebody could log in and say, brick 20,000, you know, microwaves and 150,000 ovens. and. <laughs> it's like they say, the S in IoT stands for security. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so I don't know. Like, I, look, I love gadgets and gizmos and watching my jiggers and doodads as much as the next person. But even I have my limits. I'm like, I, there is no way. Like, for me, a kettle that I can turn on from the lounge room is pointless because I still have to get up to make the coffee. Like, I don't understand why I need that. It's not like I can turn it on, it makes the coffee, and then I can walk into the kitchen and grab it. I've still got to do everything else involved in making the coffee. <laughs> and if you walk into the kitchen, you flick the kettle on, you grab the cup, you grab the coffee, you go and grab your milk, and by the time you've come back, it's spoiled anyway. So I don't understand why this is a thing. You know, your toast is going to end up on the floor regardless of whether you do it or whether the machine does. It doesn't make any difference. <laughs> 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 maybe the only difference is that it can like tell you that the toast is on the floor would you like to try again yeah <laughs> <laughs> but i don't yeah look i, I don't get it I, the, this we're at that point with technology where they're doing things for the sake of doing things they don't have any benefits there's no reason Plus to do you it and whack another hundred bucks on it yeah they're just doing it because they have to release a new model and this is literally the only thing they can do to do it and make it any different than the last 15 models they've just released some nice fins on it so it looks like it goes faster. <laughs> the speed stripes. <laughs> speed holes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, speed holes in the microwave, yeah. <laughs> That's what you want through the through the radiation mesh. It's It'll easy. solve that problem. <laughs> <laughs> the Lapsus uh, gang of hackers claimed late Tuesday that it broke into software services firm Globant and stole 70 gigabytes of source code from the company's customers. Clevent confirmed a breach, saying that some of its code was accessed without authorization. The company said in a filing that it found no evidence that other areas of its infrastructure or those of its clients were affected. The company did not name Lapsus or identified who was responsible for the breach. On its Telegram channel, Lapsus posted a screenshot of more than two dozen folders containing what it said was customer source code, including from well-known tech companies. The authenticity of the screenshot could not be immediately ascertained, but the group has previously stolen source code or other proprietary data from tech heavyweights, including Microsoft and NVIDIA. Recently, the group claimed credit for having breached Okta after breaking into one of its contractors. Lapsus has stunned and baffled cybersecurity experts (laughs) in equal measure with its combination of juvenile antics and high-level access to some (laughs) of the biggest companies in the world. Don't start laughing now because you're going to be in hysterics by the time I finish this story. You'll be rolling around the ground. The group uses a variety of methods, including bluffing, trickery, and bribes to steal passwords, Microsoft said in a blog post last week. 
Following the news of the Opta breach, British authorities announced that seven people aged 16 to 21 had been arrested at some unspecified point in the past and then later released. The authorities gave a few other details, but it was around that time that Lapsus told its fans, a few of our members are going on holiday. <laughs> Neither the break nor the arrests appear to have curbed the group's appetite for leaks. And in the, in, as they announced the globe and breach on their um, Telegram channel, they said, we're officially back from vacation. <laughs> Going away for And we've increased our VPN and security measures. We all got arrested, but they let us go because they didn't have nothing, so we went and broke into something else. Yeah, dear. Yeah, look, I don't have a problem with it. It's just funny now. Yeah, exactly. Like, it's. it. I want my open source NVIDIA drivers. You promised me. I know, right? well, pictures. They're probably trying to figure out how to make it happen. Yeah. They're like, this code is garbage. Let's just. Start from scratch. We'll rewrite it. We'll write the <laughs> NVIDIA drivers for you using the info we got. No wonder you haven't released them. <laughs> it's got to be on the dark web somewhere, surely. Uh, well, I mean, Pop's figured it out. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They're obviously there somewhere. Yeah, they've got a proprietary closed NVIDIA driver. Yeah, it still works, though. <laughs> That's good. Although <clears> apparently the AMD stuff... Is so much better. It's yeah. It's well, I've always said that, but people are only just starting to figure that out now. <laughs> <laughs> the only issue you've had was the the graphics drivers have have traditionally been an issue, but yeah, everything's still less, smooth on mine. How about yours? Yeah, yeah. And every update seems to make it a little bit better. Instead of worse, like yeah, Windows okay. was. <laughs> Uh, yeah, uh, you don't what, have what? ads in your file explorer, do you? Um, well, to be <laughs> honest, I don't know. I've never had to use it yet. <laughs> <laughs> Although I was trying to look for um, a hardware monitoring. Wasn't there uh, something program. you were saying today that some other stupid thing Microsoft was going to do? Oh, um, the one click. Yeah, so they've. They've um Internet Explorer is back. Well no, they're just the they're, they're mourning the loss of Internet Explorer saying that uh you know it's sad that it's had to go and you know they they'd like to keep it but they figure they need to get rid of it now and retire it. And then they said, But we're just gonna integrate it into Edge. <laughs> so they're basically turning Edge back into Internet Explorer, which is the whole reason they got rid of well, they created Edge was to not be Internet Explorer. When you first build up a PC <laughs> with Windows 11, maybe probably 10 and others as well, and you launch Edge and you go to google.com and it puts a banner up there saying, yeah. hey, did you know that Edge is written on the same engine as Google Chrome? Maybe you don't need Google Chrome because you've already got <laughs> Edge and it works really, really well. And then you download it and it says, are you sure you want to download this? Because yeah. you've got Edge and it's really awesome. And then when you execute it, it says, well, you know, Edge is pretty cool and it does all of the things that, and, and it does it better. And you're like three times. <clears throat> yeah. It tells you, use Edge. It's... <sighs> I'm pretty sure they, they got in trouble for that several years ago for doing exactly the same thing. Yeah. You do a search for Google Chrome, up <coughs> comes the Google search results from Google.com, and up the top they put a banner saying, don't download it, use Edge. It's like, guys, so there's, seriously, settle down. Yeah, well, I mean, I'm using on, I can't think of the, I think it's Arc, I can't think of the name of the Linux I'm using on the, uh, a couple of really old computers at, uh, at work. They just literally sit there and, like they're at the other end of the shed, so if I need to look something up on the net quickly, I can do that. That's that's all it's there for. It doesn't get used for anything. Yeah. But I'm using a really, really, really lightweight OS. It's yeah. It's thirty two thirty two bit OS. It's Linux base, Ubuntu uh, base. Um I think it's called Arc or something. And it's um it needs two hundred and fifty six meg of RAM and it runs on like a five hundred megahertz CPU and like two hundred meg hard drive. Like it's And it has so its own YouTube app. <clears throat> yeah, it's got apps for like youtube and stuff so it launches them in terminal 
and you search for the video in terminal and you type in the one you want and it loads it in the uh, dedicated VLC window so it can play like 720p videos on like a single core you know 700 meg processor like it's <laughs> really cool um but it has it launches with firefox as default um and you can it does have chromium on there as well and so i run chromium because obviously you got your normal google login you use the one thing i i don't know if i'm doing something wrong i always thought chromium would sync with chrome um but it doesn't uh, it, it syncs the user profile, but it won't sync like visited web pages and passwords. Stream and stuff, things, yeah. Which I thought was interesting, oh. but yeah. So it's um, it's amazing that how fast they like they boot this OS in like ten seconds. Like it's <laughs> so lightweight, it's amazing, and yet it's so full function. Like I can run. Um, I was just trying it on a faster system, just just for something to do, and I'm running um. All my, so I run Octoprint on a couple of um, Pies as for my uh, 3D printers and my laser engraver and stuff. Yep. And I just have an old laptop sitting there, which I basically, I do all the editing and stuff on my main computer, save the file on the server, then grab the file from the server, throw it on the laptop, and it just sits there and sends the data out to wherever it needs to send it. And before it was running Windows XP just because it was, it was always on there. And I've thrown this Linux on there and it runs Prontoface and it runs, um, you know, these two or three programs um, really, really well, like super fast. So it's perfect for like a print server and stuff as well. But it's hard to believe such a basic version of, of Linux can run such advanced programs. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, so <clears throat> um, speaking of uh, NVIDIA and stuff, NVIDIA uh, has offered its most powerful desktop graphics card to date in the GeForce RTX 3090 Ti at CES 20, 2022, promising it would be a monster GPU better than last year's RTX 3090. It would be the next big ferocious GPU. Um, says it's going to be um, like 1999 US. Yep. Um, so this thing's super fast. It's got, you know, sure a heap of specs here. It does have the new DDR6 memory, which is oh, pretty cool because nice. that's not really implemented in anything yet. No. Um, but <laughs> this, so towards the end of the article, it goes on to say, while, while, while availability of the GeForce RTX 3090 Ti may follow the same course this year as the RTX 3090 and the ADD did last year, prices of last year's 30 series graphics cards are dropping massively. And it's not because the global global chip crunch has ended. Nope. The Biden administration, U.S. Trade Representative Office, last week announced it would reinstate waivers on Trump era China tariffs for the 352 items, which included electronics. That shift in trade policy was behind Asus's announcement yesterday. Asus, Asus's, <laughs> Asus, Asus's, Asus's. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. announcement yesterday that it would reduce prices on the RTX 30 series by 25%. So, yeah, so this massive we can't have anything from China deal is falling apart. Every week there's something else they're adding to this. 352 items now. Yep. Because um, you know that massive rollout they're going to do where they're going to get rid of everything that was Chinese on their network infrastructure and replace it with all of the American... Yeah, well, Didn't about have... that. So... <clears throat> Antics Linux. Have, that's it, Antics, yeah. That's the one. It's, uh, it's really good. Um, yeah, and that's kind of like, okay, so if you build a new tower, I would like you to use the new American-made stuff if you can get it. If not, just use the stuff you were anyway. using. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so the upside of this is now that, you know, Ford can make cars again. Yep. And, you know, there's not going to be the stuff sitting around that they couldn't get chips for because they weren't allowed to, yep. you know, because nobody makes those chips except the one factory in China that makes all of them for the rest of the world. And Exactly. It's not like you can just open up. Like, you can't... This is what I tell people. Like, people bag out China's, Chinese products all the time. I'm like, yes, but nowhere in this world, else in the world can you open a factory specifically to make one chip. 
or one item or one thing. Like that's all they do. If there's a shortage in one particular area, they just open up a factory that makes those things. Yep. And then when it's finished making those things, they make it make some other thing. They don't have a factory that makes forty thousand different products. And people live. They, they do. There are some factories that do that, but they specifically have one factory that makes one product. <laughs> like and the factory has its own residential places where people live on yeah. site, and they just go to the factory do, yeah. and then go back home and sleep. Yeah, a lot of them have that. Um, the other thing is too, China has a lot of um, empty cities because it's how they keep their economy strong. They basically just send a team out and go, go and build a city over there and then build a highway to it. Yep. And, you know, the city before it's still got people in it because it's the highway crew and the road crews and the construction crews all come back to that city to live. <laughs> then you have the choice of you can either have that apartment and you get that to your apartment, you get to keep it, that house, whatever, you get to keep that. Or you can go to the next city that you're going to build. And once you finish building that, you can keep that. Or you can go to the next one. You know, so <clears throat> they, they kind of self-perpetuate. But a lot of these, um, it's actually, this is a really interesting YouTube video. If you do want to know more about that, there's two. One is um, the abandoned, uh, what, what happened to the, what's it called? What happened to the Disney ripoff parks? Yep. Or what happened to the Disney like parks or something like that? And there was half a dozen of these, like literally Disney World parks in China that was the Chinese ripoff of everything. Oh, right. And another one is um, called the Loneliest Toy Store. And there's just a massive, big, huge, multi story, multi building shopping complex in one of these abandoned towns. Yeah. And there's a guy there who's got a toy shop. <laughs> but that's all it's in. It's just a toy shop. Like. <laughs> He's got prime location. Yeah, but people come from everywhere to buy toys from him just because it's a, that's like it's just the experience of going to this shopping center and there's just a toy shop in there. <laughs> um, but yeah, because of that, there's a, there's a lot of places too that um, allow small production facilities to open up with very, very little overhead. Yep. You know, if you need to make, um, well, the, for example, the, the, um, the spanners that you make um like tighten up angle grinder discs with that come in every box with an angle grinder you get a spanner with it yep. there's one factor over there that just presses those out and, i mean that, that presses them out in different thickness materials depending on the quality of the spanner and how much they want to pay but yep. that's what its job is it just makes these these and spanners. if it's an electronics thing then <laughs> it has multiple stuff that place down the road makes one component for it that place up that way yeah. makes one component and they just bring them all into the one place yeah put it together and then send it off there's even one um one production facility i've seen that um one of my bosses went to a few years ago when we we're looking at some equipment and one building was here and one building was here making some stuff and they needed to expand so they expanded to these buildings back here and then they expanded to these buildings back here so now they take up like both sides of this block and then they have a, another company that merges both of these components here. So they've actually got like six warehouses and then another one here where all the components end up anyway. Yep. So they don't even need to worry about like shipping them or freight or anything. Literally the warehouses, one's on that side of the road, one's on that side of the road. And at the end of the block is where they all meet anyway. Yeah. <laughs> and it's just like, they just put um, conveyor belts in place, you know. Like, that in America. <laughs> no. So, you know... It, that's I mean you can't do that anywhere else in the world. There's nowhere else nowhere else in the world you could get away with doing that sort of thing. Right. Uh, India does it to some degree. Um, you oh, know, Philippines and Indonesia do it to some degree, but they don't they, they don't do it with the flair that the Chinese do it. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and not as cheap. No, well that's the thing though. It's not necessarily just, like the Chinese will make the product to the quality that you wanted you asked for it. Mm. If you want the cheapest, nastiest thing that they can send off the production line, well, they'll make that. But if you want super high quality, like the batteries that we supply the Maxons, we've been working with them for over 15 years with the one battery manufacturer. Yep. And this battery manufacturer makes like 80% of the plates for deep cycle batteries in the world. Like there's not, there's only, you know, well, there's a lot of places that make um, it's like there's only uh, three companies in the world that make LCD screens. Yeah, yeah LG, Samsung, and um, RCA. RCA. 
can't remember now. Oh, the third one is, but yeah, um, yeah. So you know, and like they've been making these plates for years, and <clears throat> they there's there's lots of companies that make crappy plates, but like even these guys, their cheapest one that they do is still better than half of the ones that come out of anywhere else. Yeah. But I mean, <laughs> it's it's cheaper to do them there. You couldn't do anything for the same price if you had American manufacturing business with people with American wages, even though they get below living wage anyway. You can't. Like, there are battery manufacturers in the States, like Inter, uh, Interstate and Optima, or Optima is in Mexico. Actually, most of them are moving to Mexico now. I think even US Power's finally moved to Mexico. But that's the thing. They're trying to... They're they have buying. to rename them. Not <laughs> yeah. US Power anymore. Well, they're, they're doing that to, to save money because Mexicans obviously work for less than Americans who don't work for that much. Yep. You know, and I'm guessing the, the real estate and everything's probably cheaper in Mexico as well, but... Um, you just have to pay the cartel. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, and, and that's the thing. Like, it's... There are uh, there are manufacturers who do that. Um, Century, to some degree, makes batteries in Australia. That's a whole other animal again. But when you when you weigh up value for dollar for quality, um, it's very very hard to beat China when you've got a company that's dedicated to making quality. Even their best quality components are still generally. I mean, you get somebody like. Um, Victron, for example, who's a really well-known um, um, Norway, I think they are. I was going to say Scandinavia, but I think it's Norway. They're really well-known in the solar industry for the solar components they make. They make really high-end components. Yep. Um, and they make them in their own factories, which is true, but they don't make the components that go into them. And the vast majority of the components they use are Chinese. They, just they were using it. German components until they learnt that most of those components were Chinese via a German supplier. <laughs> <laughs> so cut out the middleman, you know. So it, it, you know, they they can make really good products if you allow them to. Um, but even when they do, they're still cheaper than a, a half-assed product coming from somewhere else in the world. Yep. So a major update has been announced. GNOME forty-two has been released for you Linux fans. Most of GNOME 42's core apps, with the exception of Nautilus, now use the lib add waiter style sheet as their default theme, as do a swath of third party and community apps written in GTK4. The change is more than just skin deep. Lib add waiter offers a round lighter, rounder, and more compact look than earlier versions of add waiter, and includes more modern looking toolbars, menus, buttons, toggles, info boxes, etc. An updated GNOME shell theme also features in GNOME 42. This uses less bass, boasts better contrast, and does away with triangular callouts from panel applets. On screen bubbles, example, example when uh, changing bubbles. brightness and volume, <laughs> are also smaller and more compact than before. GNOME 42 <laughs> supports a new free desktop dark mode preference too. GTK 4 uh, lib add waiter apps opt in to respect this setting by default though apps can offer an individual override the transition fade effect makes switching between light and dark mode feel fluid with gnome's default wallpaper also changing deepening on dark light mode gnome 42 comes with new screenshot feature this makes it easy to take screenshots and screen recordings without needing to install or open other apps just hit print screen you can change this shortcut and an interactive overlay appears from which you can snap or record the whole screen, a selection portion, or a specific app window. A pair of new apps make their formal debut in GNOME 42 console, an alternative to GNOME terminal, and text editor, a simplified analog to get it, but with more modern UI and some interesting features like autosave. Nautilus doesn't boast a GTK4 levered weight of revamp in this release, but it does gain a new path bar that supports scrolling, a new end of path bar context menu, and more roomy file folder renaming popover. Other quick changes in, well, other changes quickly in GNOME 42 are videos, aka Totem, supports hardware accelerated decoding, reduced memory usage and faster performance in tracker, reduced input latency, redesigned display, appearance user settings. Web supports hardware accelerated rendering on all websites, reduced energy consumption for video playback, 
Maps now shows icons for U-turns in turn-by-turn -turn routing and remote desktop connections use the RDP protocol. And from research I was doing, people are estimating this will be in, uh, Gnome 42 will be in Pop! OS around June. Yep. Yep. A lot of uh, that as well. OBS, which is a program that we use, um, and it's natively supported Linux for, for quite a while being open source. Yep. Um, but they've actually just got themselves into the Flatpak library. Yes. So Flatpak, for people that don't know, is... <laughs> I guess it's like a setup for Windows. It's like Windows Store where you can just look yeah. up the install. Well, it's, it's like a setup.exe. Like you get given the file, you click it and install it. Like you don't yep. have to muck around with stuff. Um, obviously, there's the Pop Store. And if it depends um, on something else, it'll automatically install that without you having to yeah. worry about it. And that's sort of something that's been a, a, a bit of a bugbear with, with Linux. They generally, called it but, dependency hell. Yeah. And it was right. But the flatpak stuff, yeah, it's smart enough to know what you don't have and what it needs to make it run and yep. and stuff like that, which is really good. And, and it's even easier than, than 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 that now because it's a store, but traditionally it's still a command. Flatpak itself is still a command line store. You have to go install space flatpak space obs blah blah blah. So, but now in pop, they've got their own pop store, um, which automatically gets hold of flat pack stuff and snap and they also have the snap store which snaps snaps together the flat pack stuff yep. um and there's another i think the actual flat pack store actually has a gooey store as well so and it's really you getting simple it's like you do, hey you can run it from discover and that's the gooey is that what it is yeah, yeah I do something like that. um and so yeah so you like it's getting so easy. It's it's actually, in some respects, I put it more like installing an Android app. You go to the Play Store, you click on install, and it just does everything, and then you go run. If I can't install it <clears> through <throat> the Pop Store or Discover, I have very good chance I will not install it. Yeah, you find something, you find an equivalent. If, if I'm looking for a terminal <laughs> program, I ended up with Kitty Term, which is quite a nice program. But I went into, I looked online, recommended terminal programs for Ubuntu, found one, look in a pop store, not there, look in discover, not there, okay, next one, look here, look there, no, next one, look here, yes, it is there, install it, try it out, no, I don't like that one, uninstall, takes it away for you, just click on the button, Yeah. look for the next one, try out a few of them and ended up with one I like. When I was learning pop and one mistake I've made and I've kind of haven't figured out how to fix it early on, um, there was a. Where's Mr. T gone? Yeah. Hello? What have I done? <laughs> oh, it's there the moon. Go. So early on, I did a thing with Steam where I couldn't find Steam in the pop store. Yep. So I installed Steam manually through the command prompt yep. but it was in the snap store and then when i open up snap it goes oh you've got that program let me install my version of it. so the problem is i now have two steams uh. and i can't figure out how to uninstall the one that i manually installed because the uninstall command doesn't work because the other one overwrote it and doesn't know what to do with it uh, maybe you just got two icons then <laughs> so no no they're separate like you click on the first one it loads the steam i've loaded and i click on the second one and it goes please log in so it's actually two separate versions of uh, steam <laughs> i was gonna <laughs> so say it was couple... just if it was just <laughs> icons you can press the super button they call it in Linux, which is the windows button then type in menu and you can edit what icons appear in there from the menu program yeah no it's it's actually two separate installs <laughs> I've done that with a couple of programs, but that was just me learning how it works. It's not a big deal. I'm, it yep. doesn't worry me. But um, I've got yeah, two steams. just a couple of things you got to watch. So sometimes when you find the multiple programs in the Snap Store and the Pop Store and the Discover Store, you can actually install three different versions of the same program. <laughs> so and just like check too because when it when <laughs> it came, oh, what was it? There was one program that I installed. I did a search in the pop store. Two different groups are building it for the pop store. Mm. One of them, the application is two years old. The other one is the latest up-to-date one. But if you do a search and you just install the first one you see, 
you might get an outdated get program. Outdated one. Yeah. So check down the bottom. It says what's new, and like for Steam, it's got uh, one point naught naught seventy four December twelve oh two one. So you can guess from that what which one might be the latest one. Yeah. Yeah, I think I did that with um. There's a program that was called. I've got the same program on here twice, but it's called two different things. Uh, uh, it's called Q4 Wine. Yep. It's basically a, a Windows emulation. It, it's wine. It's but um, there was two program two versions. That, that's what I got caught out with. But they actually gave it a different name. One's Q4 Wine. And I can't think off the top of my head what the other one was. Oh, right. um, and one's a current version of it and one's an antiquated version that they don't support anymore. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I got them from different stores. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, you've just got to be careful. You can you can install the same program from different stores and end up, um, yeah, end up having the same program on. And the problem is because they're installed in different directions, they are physically different programs. So if you install one and you run a different one and you can't find the stuff you're working on because it's not under that version, it's under a different version. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> so That's it for me. We've hit an hour. Did you have anything quick? Yeah, no, that'll do me. That'll do. It's good night from him. And it's good night from him. <laughs> Thanks for listening to Aussie Tech Head Show. We can be found at Facebook, Twitter and YouTube. Email us Will or Warlock at AussieTechHeads.com.au and go to AussieTechRadio.com 24-7 playback of tech-related shows. See you next time. Bye. Bye.